Kia ora, this is Anderson's Odyssey. I'm Jacob Anderson and my guest today is Stu Robertson, creator of Peace in One, uh, 10,000 Hands, a global art project to challenge and reinvigorate the conversations of peace. How are you going, Stu? I'm good. Good to see you again, bro. Yeah, it's good to see you. Hey, you know, obviously with COVID and there's a lot of stress and, and I mean, you, you've been kind of promoting um, this or, or working on this project for quite a number of years, but do you think it's changed much now or do you think the, the purpose of the, the project has changed with the new kind of world that we're living in now? Yeah, yeah, it's a new world, isn't it? I think that, so when I started the project um, about eight or nine years ago, it was really to put a lens and a magnifying glass over um, what it means to exist in the human condition and uh, travel the world and photograph people and ask them basically one simple question, what does peace mean to you? And that's something that we all deserve as humans, is to live in peace, essentially. So when I, this was pre-terror, it was pre, you know, 2008, there's been a whole lot of things that have happened since then. And when I started it, people were like, why do we need peace? The world was going through kind of a very peaceful patch. Um, but I've always felt that humans, animals, nature have never needed peace like we need it now. And COVID has just kind of exploded the whole conversation. It's really put a, a magnifying glass over this conversation in terms of if you throw COVID into a bucket and you mix it up with the rest of the world, that's inversely disproportionate. While humanity has been sort of crushed into desperation, uh, nature all around the world is taking over. You know, I went for a walk this morning in downtown Auckland, there's twoies in the trees. You know, there's examples of, you know, all around the world without sort of relitigating them of how this sort of balance happens. And I think that, you know, I, I hold the same line. You know, we've never needed peace like we need it now. And it's not about the lack of um, armaments. It's not about the lack of conflict. Uh, it's about where we sit as humans and the human condition. And if you travel around the world and you ask people what peace means to them, they all essentially have the same answer, you know. And what is that? <laughs> well, um, so before I, before I give you what the answer essentially is, <laughs> after, after, after kneeling down in front of over 3,500 people and taking their portrait, holding the white rose, um, I wanted a symbol of peace that a gang member, a murderer, a religious person, um, someone who did not speak my language, which is English, um, could understand and interpret. So the white rose is the oldest symbol of peace on the planet and has always been recorded as a symbol of peace and pure love in any culture. So it's not something that I need to communicate. Um, it's like an emoji. If you send someone a thumbs up or a smiley face, even if they're in Africa or some part of Europe, you understand the conversation. So that was the first part of it. Um, and so it's to create this commonality and then, so that's to say that I've photographed people from uh, a lot of different religions uh, across a lot of borders and a lot of areas with conflict. And essentially what people will say to you, regardless of how desperate their situation is, uh, is that peace starts within and then your family and then your village and then it goes out from there. And if you look at... Um, you know, religious leaders, whether it's the Dalai Lama or whoever it is um, that I've met and photographed, they all talk about inner peace, creating peace in the home and then peace in the village, and it goes out from there. So when, when you ask peace, when you ask people what peace means, then they generally will talk about the, the inner peace and then it radiating out from there without any specific requests for clean water, you know, no bombs and all the other things that you can imagine that are sort of visceral in some people's daily life. Yeah, and so you, you just mentioned then, I was going to ask you how, how far through are you? So about three and a half thousand at this stage, is it? Yeah. Yeah, so all seven continents, including Antarctica. Yes, where we met and I learned about yeah. the project a lot. <laughs> yeah, and uh, over 50 countries. And it, it's quite staggering in terms of the, the intense similarity that people share, um, even when you would imagine that their situation is in desperate need of more things, which in the Western world, when, you know, we send in, in um, a, I'll use Haiti as an example. So when I visited Haiti, America sent tons and tons and tons of rice to Haiti. And that was one of their crops, the main crop 
and Haiti was rice. So they collapsed farming, essentially, after the earthquake by sending the rice. And then what people do whenever there's a, uh, a flood or a tsunami or an earthquake is they send clothing and shoes. And the other thing that Haiti had, um, mainly for the female population, was in, in manufacturing was shoes and clothing and a lot of t-shirts. So that collapsed. Um, and then the UN turned up and various other things happened. But essentially, what, what Haiti really wanted, and if you go and talk to them now, is they're like, you know, we don't necessarily need, look at what you're doing, look at the balance or imbalance you're creating when you do one thing, the, the, the butterfly effect, something else happens. Um, and so when you go into these, uh, City Soleil is the largest slum in the Northern Hemisphere, and Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So it's essentially, they think about 400,000 people living without reticulated sewage, power, water, all that kind of stuff. And it's literally a fight every day to survive. It's an extraordinarily violent place, murder, rape, abduction, death happen every single day. Um, I went in there and photographed. It was a bit of a stressful situation. And even under that intense stress of living, you know, you lock yourself in your tin shed every night. Um, and you, you know you, you you fight for your survival and your children's survival. They have very similar needs and wants to someone who can just turn a tap on and have fresh water like, magically appear, or flick a switch and have power. In terms of that inner peace, they don't you know peace to, peace to them is not a, a constant supply of food and things like that. Sure, they talk about water, but that's that's a common thread that happens wherever you are around the world in terms of the human condition and what we all perceive peace to be. And you've, yeah. you've sort of, uh, you've taken these photos of all sorts of different people. Are there any, uh, including a number of uh, celebrities and, and the Dalai Lama, as you mentioned, are any particular ones that really stand out or that you've kind of really been, um, uh, I guess, overwhelmed or shocked with their, their responses or the way that they've kind of reacted? Um. Yeah, a couple. I, I think that, so, you know, uh, Mickey Rourke and Daryl Hannah and Demi Moore and Emily Blunt and Ringo Starr, and there's been a whole lot of people that I've had the fortune to sit with and be with. And, you know, I was with in Studio A with Ringo for his 70th birthday, um, which is where the Beatles and the Doors and all these sort of people have recorded and, you know, spent time with Demi Moore at her house and stuff like that. And so you kind of, you sort of imagine that star power, but I think part of being a Kiwi, part of being a New Zealander is we're like, it's all good, bro. Like we just, it doesn't really phase us at all. So you would possibly think that those would be the most impactful situations, but the most raw, visceral, brutal and memorable situations for me have been on an island in the Bismarck Sea um, where they live like they did 20,000 years ago. There's no combustion engines. There's no plastic bowls. They make fire, they catch fish off the reef, they have root vegetables and, and, you know, ground up coconut and that kind of stuff. And when you go and move into that village and you live with them, uh, th those, are the, those are the moments that really um, imprint on you. Um, I've, I've photographed a couple of um, gang members in LA and when you ask what does peace mean to you, peace means if and nothing to me. And so you ask, in that situation I would ask, this, you know, big, you know, tattooed person, um, why are you holding a flower and why are you standing for peace? Like this, you know, leaders of gangs and stuff like this. And they, they, peace to them means nothing. They've bought into an environment. They stick with it. They're committed. Uh, there's no backing out. But for them, when they have children and a partner, they don't want the cycle to repeat. So in those situations, those people have been standing for peace for their children. Uh, so that, that's the caveat to that situation. So it's the raw, gritty situations that you find yourself in um, that are absolutely the most memorable. Um, way more than someone who's been in a movie or had a great recording career or something like that, you know. And, and do, you find, um, do you find yourself just kind of exploring these places and then decide uh, to approach people or, or have you got, do you kind of go with certain places in mind and certain stories that you're looking to tell or, or is it a bit organic and kind of you, you, you take it either way when the opportunities arrive? Yeah. 
So, um, so, I'm, so I'm not a trained photographer. I had to buy a camera and a, a, um, and a rose to do the project. The rose is silk, by the way, just in case you're wondering how I, I magic up a, um, a white rose in the middle of the tar desert or something like that. Um, so I had to train, I essentially had to kind of train myself. I'm a little bit creative, but not a photographer. And then I'm also an introvert. So it's well recorded that I, I don't talk to you if you sit up next to me on an airplane and I haven't had a birthday party since I was 10 and all this kind of stuff. So um, approaching complete strangers uh, in any environment, uh, whether it's social or it's just completely random, uh, I find uh, very difficult, but it's something I've had to overcome to execute on my idea. And uh, I do, so the Dalai Lama was targeted, come here, let's give it a go. There was no guarantees, there was no appointment. Um, so that's a specific trip for a specific outcome. I was invited to Cape Town in South Africa by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So I went there to photograph him, bolted on some extra time and went to Clip Town and Cryfontaine and Lavender Hill and Soweto when I went to Johannesburg after. And that's very, very organic. Um, it's literally where the wind blows me. And every time I photograph someone, I'm trying to create an artwork as well as a story. So the pressure that's on me uh, when I have the camera is to create something beautiful that people want to hang on their wall, um, which will will share the story. So it's a it's a mix of both, but it's mainly organic. Yeah, and and I mean when you talk about that artwork, for for me when I think about art, I often think about how it can share a scientific story or, or introduce a new idea to people as well and you know when when we were together in Antarctica you you took a photo of Charlie and a fantastic photo of him do, how, where do you see that space where art is trying to share or address some of the the complex issues that we have in society today be that climate change or, or something else like like peace or like the message that you're trying to share yeah it's a really good question, bro. I've got to tell you. No, I, mean, practice, I don't know if you practice that question or, or what, but anyway, it's a very profound question, actually. So as an artist, um, you don't state the obvious. It's not your job to hold a placard up and say, this is, this is my comment, this is my statement. I believe as an artist, it's your job to hold a mirror and reflect society back on itself and highlight things that you want to talk about rather than making the blatantly obvious stated and to that end it's i so i i push a button i don't tell the person how to pose i don't tell i don't explain anything the person does what they want so ricky gervais and jamie lee curtis for instance put the rose in their mouth and they that's that was i wouldn't have put the rose in my mouth as, we had a we had a bit of a chat about i don't touch door handles and all that kind of stuff never have but so that's what they chose to do right um so i'm really just the middleman when it comes to recording this moment and then I ask people five questions and the last question is what does peace mean to you so I'm, I'm really just recording without too much influence this this conversation and then that gets given to the world so it's less of my projection than it is of society's projection um, across the countries and, and the places that I go to and the benefit with art is that it can talk across religion language boundaries, you know, governmental beliefs in terms of are you left or are you right. Art, art sits in a very, very powerful um, place and especially at the moment, if you want to talk about climate change and COVID and governments and swinging left and swinging right and where the world is currently, um, artists are in a very, very sort of um, almost like the ability to highlight things, put a lens over things, put things in a bucket and give other people the chance to reflect on what that message is or what that painting or photograph or poem is about rather than someone foisting upon them what their belief system is so i mean you know my thing is just a mirror it's not a placard yeah, it's, and it's interesting you know you kind of make that point and i think when i think about COVID and people have had a bit of time now to reflect and we're seeing people picking up instruments again or starting to yeah. paint or doing things that they used to do and they just their lives have been so busy and now that they've found a bit of time it's um it's been quite quite cool do, do you see um if we're sort of in lockdown for a while do you see it the project kind of just pausing or will you do a few new zealand photos or how do you kind of see that 
playing out as you try and get towards the 10,000? Is it just a slow burn and, and you'll just let it go as it, as it comes? Yeah. So I, I, I feel no, I normally live, when I'm in New Zealand, I normally live in Queenstown and it's a, a melting pot of the world, you know. Uh, thick and heavy on South American influence and workers and all that kind of stuff down there. So I could go to, I could go to Lambton Quay, I could go to, um, I could go and stand in front of the cathedral in Christchurch or downtown Auckland and knock a whole lot of photographs off. But it's it's the practice of the organic, um, which you talked about before, which um, lets uh, the mix of humanity boil up. So it's about getting people in your environment, getting the gritty backgrounds, getting the stories um, that's important. So I don't, I don't feel any compunction to race through the 10,000. Um, along the way, we're doing, we've got another film coming up. We've already done a couple of films. We've got another book coming up. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, anyone that follows Peace in 10,000 Hands will realise I'm very glitchy when it comes to sharing online. Um, I've just started reposting three days ago. Part of my introverted nature um, means I have, I have difficulty sharing socially about what's going on, um, which I'm sort of coming to terms with. So, you know, whether it's sharing the message online, reconnecting with people, setting trips up, working on the next book, there's, there's lots and lots to do apart from the photography. Yeah, and I read somewhere a few years ago you were looking at getting the project into space. Yeah. Are those conversations still happening? Is that is that uh, still uh, looking like an option? It is looking like an option. So uh, one conversation is around having uh, the white rose engraved on the outside of um, a, a essentially a deep space probe um, and sending a hard drive with uh, all 10,000 people with each of their messages about what peace means to them and each, an image of each of them holding the white rose. And then the other conversation is about um, getting the white rose to the International Space Station and having um, a scientist up there be photographed, you know, with the, you know, holding it through on the other side of the window is the, this magical green and uh, blue ball, uh, the earth. And um, so I take all of the photographs. So that would probably one of the only ones that I wouldn't take. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, I think it's important uh, to put the message of peace into the universe. But I think also the lens of looking at the white rose over the globe. Um, I did make it rounding, by the way. Um, over the globe, <laughs> um, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like a shroud. I don't know. I, I think it's 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 a conversation. Um, that everyone on the planet wants to have. So I think it's apt that at some point we get it up there um, and take and, 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 and incorporate that photograph into the project. So yeah, we're having those conversations now. Cool, yeah, I know, I know the, the image of Scott Kelly when he grew a flower in space, I think, and there's this picture of him and that was the first flower that had, had ever bloomed uh, at the space station. And, that, and then there's other people that have talked about, you know, trying to get a little plant uh, in this kind of miniature greenhouse on the moon or on Mars, and yeah. if they could do that, what sort of questions would that uh, spark in society, or, or would that you know open up new ideas of curiosity and, and um, sort of the the reality of of how fragile things are? Or it's kind of just an interesting idea to think about. You know, what does what does that impact have on different people, and can that inspire people to? To do different things, and have you have you seen anything like that? Have you had people kind of come up to you and 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 mention, you know, the 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 impacts from some of the the work through this kind of message of peace that you're working on? Um, there was a, a work that I did called the Exquisite Clarity of Standing Together, uh, and it's 85 images. It takes up it took up a whole wall in um, a museum show that I did, and each image is about 400 by 400 in in and they're in um, five lines. And um, you, have, you have 85 people from about 50 countries standing looking directly at you. And um, I did a collaboration with Tiki Tane, and we, we turned that, um, that work into a, a film, and he did the score for it. And uh, to see people stand in front of that and literally cry uh, and, and then come back and then come back the next day 
on on mass humanity has significant power and if you can imagine Rangers and Celtic playing a game in Scotland, a, game, a football against each other, you have green on one side and you have blue on the other, and you hear the chances they go back and forth, is that when you get people together en masse um, saying something or creating movement, it has incredible power. You know, one bagpiper has phenomenal power. You put a hundred bagpipers together playing the same tune, it just it gets you right here. And I think that the force of 10,000 people standing um, together, which from religious people to other sorts of people in society, normal people, mothers, fathers, all this kind of thing, um, it's, it's incredibly powerful to see our similarity in the human condition. So I think it does kind of get you right, right in the solar plexus, you know, just because of the mass of it. Oh, for sure. And when you're, when you're visiting some of these you know, uh, war-stricken places or um, areas where there's water quality or, or poverty. Is there other philanthropic work and charities that you're working with when you go to those places, or is there other projects associated um, with the with the Peace in Ten Thousand Hands project? Yeah, so the hundred percent of the artwork sales go to the project and projects that we support, um, and so the other thing we do is gift artwork. So if people are having um, a charity auction or we've done it for Starship Hospital and we, we, a whole lot of stuff basically. So we gift that with some, and a hundred percent. So we, we pay for the pr production packing and all the rest of it. And then the artwork goes up on a, when we used to be able to have garlic in us and that kind of thing um, gets auctioned off on the night and a hundred percent of the sale goes to those charities. And uh, people, when I started the project were like, you know, this is a philanthropic project. Who is the money going to? And the part of the practice of the project is discovering what needs to happen when you're on the ground. It's very hard to have uh, this, what, this Western kind of outlook on what you think needs to happen. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was in, uh, in a village called Delwara um, in India. I was on my way up to Rajasthan and I stopped in, in this village and I, I photographed a lot of people um, and it was quite a poor village and they had the chili man and the chaiwala and that, you know, as you the snake chant, all this kind of stuff as you go through the village, one person making the pots and all that kind of stuff. Lots of families living close, town square and it was quite wonderful actually. And so I decided that I would ask um, about the poorest school. I found out there was nine schools in this village and um, that you know, my 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 big impression is that you know clearly you will need stationery, and you'll need pens and paper and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, found out who the headmaster was. I approached her and explained that I would have stationery delivered to the school, which was what I thought they needed. When I saw the children, uh, they were children of solo parents or children that had some sort of thing that made them not normal in the eyes of society. Um, and so they were very poor and very, very poor. And the, the clothing was tied to them in the form of rags. So it was, it was quite a distressing sight. And the, uh, the headmaster explained the last thing that she needs is pens and paper. They're just, they're just trying to teach these children how to survive, how to interact, how to make a living, how to, how to exist in a, in a broken home. Um, and she expressed that um, what they need is, is clothing and they need food and they, they start from there, but they certainly didn't need stationery at this time. So that's the, the Haiti example is another good one is you, you send them what you think people need when they're in, when they're in need, but your, the lens with which you look at it is from where you're at, not from where they're at. So as we travel, we identify um, people and projects that need help, but specifically what they need, not what you think they need. Yeah, sorry, that was a really long answer. I hope I kind of made the point. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. I mean, that's the beauty of uh, long form conversations like this. You don't have yeah. to kind of quickly say things and, and, and then um, move on, which is one thing. But you posted the other day, I saw uh, a little uh, the post about the sound of silence and in, in the final edit stage. Can you share anything about about the... 
the doco or is, or is that still kind of, we can't share no, no. any information? No, no, no. I, of course I can share information with you, absolutely. So, so the, 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 the last time I was in Antarctica, I came out to the dry valleys again and got to hang out with you. And we were filming, um, we were filming for um, this documentary piece that, um, that I sort of had conceived prior to Antarctica and hadn't really worked out what the creative lock point for it was. Um, and a, a lot of people in amongst explaining that peace starts within, they talk about silence, they talk about space, they talk about breath, you know, and if OM is the universal sound, you know, the, the only place I've ever heard that is Antarctica, you know, the deafening silence, you know, which is, which is absolutely and utterly prevalent in, um, in the dry valleys. It's, it's the most extraordinary feeling of, a mix of dread and complete elation to have, you know, sound um, just completely removed. That's the most extraordinary thing. And, and for me, my mind filled some of the gaps and some crazy things happened. But the, the human brain kind of tries to fill that gap. And it's something that's been well recorded and talked about the deafening silence. And it sort of struck me that most people will never get to experience what deafening silence is. Um, and if you could explain it as a photographer and a visual person, what would it look like? You know, what does the deafening sound look like? And so that was the, the goal of the second trip. And I have to be honest and say it's taken a little bit of time, but getting the team together to edit it and interpret um, in terms of a score of music that, that goes through it, the voiceovers and all that kind of stuff, it's taken a little bit of time. So. We're working on a three minute version and a 40 minute version for television at the moment. And it really is, uh, the journey starts in the hustle bustle of places like India and you know the little pack cities in Papua New Guinea and then slowly stretches out to, to being in, in Antarctica. And whether you're on a Haglin or a Ski Do or a C-130 or whatever it is, the interesting thing with getting where you need to be in Antarctica and getting to Antarctica especially, is incredibly noisy, like everything is noisy. And then there's this moment, you know, the helicopter's gone, the gene sets off, and then this deafening silence rests on you like a wet blanket, basically. So it's, it's, it's a journey of exploration to try and explain to people what that feels like and what it looks like. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's really exciting because you met, I mean, you met all sorts of different people doing different projects and everybody talks, for me, when people say, what, you know, what is Antarctica like? There's two things I say. One is the scale of everything. It's really hard to understand how far things are away because there's no trees or there's no reference points to understand. You know, you look across and it's 40 kilometers to the next mountain range and then you've just got this white sea of ice. It's that. And then the, the deafening silence or this kind of weird, um, sort of it's yeah it's so hard to explain and then you try and capture that when you're it's somewhere in New Zealand even on a silent or still day and there's always still a bird or there's still something that kind of impedes the the, the non-sound or the silence or, or whatever you call it but I've always found it really interesting when you've gone there and you, you you've taken this quite simple approach and then you the turning it into this really interesting story. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing how it all ends up. Stu, it's been um, fantastic to talk to you today. And where, where can people um, look, look up uh, the Peace and what the Peace and 10,000 Hands project if they're looking or they're interested in, in checking out the artwork? Yeah. So we're on um, Instagram, which is just Peace and 10,000 Hands. So 10, the number. So one with four zeros. Um, and you can, we're on, we've been on 60 Minutes and TEDx and all that kind of stuff. So if you Google it, you can, there's quite a bit that will, will pop up on the Google, but the best, and I promise I'm, I'm into posting now on Instagram. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it up. So it's probably, it's probably the best place to, um, to check us out. Yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. Sure. It's been great to chat with you. And you as well. Cheers. Cheers.